Welcome to this week's World Stories. The harsh conditions of India's coal fields. Thailand's waterways go electric. But first to southern Spain. Migrants mostly from Africa have long worked the farms in Andalusia, but their hopes of a better life are often dashed by harsh conditions and scarce opportunities. For these illegal migrants, the struggle for survival begins every morning at the break of dawn. At a roundabout near Almeria, they gather and wait, hoping to be hired. Working in the nearby greenhouses is their only source of income in a place where they believed they would find wealth and freedom. Those who are invited into one of these minivans are the lucky ones. Social worker Jose Garcia wants to warn the migrants about exploitation. He and his colleagues from the Andalusian Labor Union say illegal migrants are particularly vulnerable. Handing out flyers, he wants to inform them about their rights. For one day, you're supposed to earn 46 euros and 72 cents, only eight hours of work. These illegal workers here might not have any documents, but they do have rights. We want to let them know that the Spanish law is protecting them and about the minimum wage they're supposed to earn and the conditions they should demand. But it's hard to demand your rights if you don't have documentation. Maro from Mali takes us to what he calls his home, tucked away between the many greenhouses. He shares a flat with seven other farm workers and is lucky to have electricity and running water. But there's not enough money to buy proper food, he says. Leftovers from last night's dinner, plain rice and nothing else. Further down the road, we find an abandoned house, home to a group of Moroccan migrants. 18-year-old Youssef invites us in to see how they live. The hygienic conditions are poor. They have no running water to wash their clothes. These containers are what they use to shower. We wonder why Youssef stays here in these conditions. He says life in Morocco was as bad as it is here, but after three years as an illegal alien, he can get an official residence permit in Spain. At night, the Spanish Sea Rescue Service saves 54 young men from sub-Saharan Africa. The dream of a better life is what brings them to Europe. And in this very moment, everyone on board believes they're going to achieve exactly that. Here in Germany, restrictions on reuniting refugee families proved to be a major sticking point in talks on forming a new coalition government a few weeks ago. This woman told us her story. We meet up with Osema Demira after her German lessons. This is how her day starts here in Berlin, without her children or her husband. She tells us about her escape from Syria. It all happened in 2015. She left her three children behind. That's what her husband wanted. Now he's in prison in Syria, she's alone in Berlin, and her children without their parents in Syria. Back then, I decided to leave the country in the hopes of helping my children by starting anew and then bringing them here. That was my only goal. She shows us pictures of her children. That's her son and two daughters with their grandmother. Sebastian Mu helps her deal with the situation. He's had a lot to do since 2016. That's when the German government stopped refugees like Osema from reuniting with their families. It was supposed to only last for two years, but now the conservatives want to extend the suspension. 
Das bedeutet schlicht und einfach, dass That simply means that families are separated for years. That parents are separated from their children. That spouses are separated for years. For a period of time that has no definable end. And this is very hard for families to deal with. It's catastrophic. In the center, Osema shows us her favorite passage in the German Constitution. Article 6, the special protection of marriage and family. Since the telephone lines to Syria are disrupted, all she has are photos. I keep getting photos of my children, but that only makes it worse, because I can't experience them firsthand. Her last hope is German politics. Osema hopes that someday she'll be allowed to live a life in safety, together with her children. Coal mining in India has had a disastrous impact on both the environment and on people. But often, it remains the only way to earn a living. Savitri Mato is 17 years old. She scavenges in the coal mines of Charya. Her brother Shiv Kumar is just nine. The two begin work at dawn every day. It's fraught with dangers. The coal has to be hacked out of exposed seams. Once, Shiv Kumar badly injured himself while working. The open coal pit is 150 meters deep. Savitri makes four to five trips each day. She has to watch out for the police, who chase them away and confiscate their coal. I don't have a choice. I have to do this work. My parents are illiterate. They've worked as laborers all their lives. They can't do anything else. So I try to help them by earning money. I really don't like the work. My heart isn't in it. A few hours of work fetches the equivalent of three euros. That's more than what people earn here as day laborers. Some 30,000 people work as coal scavengers. But they pay a heavy price. Burning raw coal releases toxic smoke and gases causing widespread asthma and respiratory illnesses in the area. Jharia sits atop one of the world's largest coal reserves. The gigantic open pits and deep mines here account for a quarter of India's coal production. The resulting toxic emissions have devastated the environment. The coal fires have destroyed houses and triggered landslides. Ashok Agarwal has been campaigning for the rights of illegal coal workers like Savitri. He says India is paying a huge human cost in its dash for coal. This government just doesn't bother. So right now coal is very important. It is very important for their development. They've got to develop massive cities to show to the world that they are at par with them. And at the cost of these people, there's a huge amount of human beings who are going to be deprived of whatever even they are, some or the other, eking out a living, that will also go. Savitri is determined to find a way out of the coal mines. Scavenging also helps pay for college. She goes there every day after work to ensure her dreams of getting a good job don't go up in smoke. Our last report takes us to Thailand, where diesel and petrol engines power traffic on the rivers and canals. Go Electric, says a German company planning a silent revolution. They might be iconic, but they can be quite a nuisance as well. On Bangkok's canals and floating markets, long tail boats are not only a familiar sight, but a familiar sound as well. David Hunter and his team want to change that. Today they're trying to convince the local authorities that going electric has many upsides. They've brought one of their test motors along. After all, 
Proof of the pudding is in the eating. Most people's mind when they switch from a combustion to an electric is how long will my battery last? Um, but I think for, for, for areas like this where you don't go too fast, um, an electric motor it can go all day without recharging. So uh, I think once people get to understand it and feel it, that um, anxiety they had before will quickly be taken away. Before they can go for an e-spin, the conventional motor needs to be removed. Then the much lighter torpedo engine is mounted to the boat. It only takes a few flicks of the wrist. At first, Mr. Chuan, the local boatman, doesn't seem to trust the three horsepower drive. But the slim engine provides all the thrust he needs. At this now, you have like 10 kilometer range, which is probably all day of, yeah, all day of travel. <laughs> After a few minutes, initial skepticism gives way. For a boat like mine, this motor definitely has enough power, and it's so easy to use, you just turn the handle. Thailand's tourism authority is already on board with the new technology. Okay. Provided the investors don't shy away from the costs. At 2,000 euros, the retail price for this model is about 10 times as much as a comparable combustion engine. Its peace and tranquility, however, is certainly priceless.